interested in all things psychology, you are at the right place. Here, we bring exciting and thought-provoking ideas. We travel into our minds and some things out of this world. Welcome to the Psychology Debrief. Hello and welcome to the Psychology Debrief. I am your host, Sam Fairlam, and today we're talking about humans and animals. Are we really that different? I'm joined today by Dr. Rob Backlund, whose uh, research focuses on the evolution of cultural communication systems in animals, and also PhD candidate Aisha Bellamy, whose Hi. interest concerns the evolutionary bases for social decisions and cognitive biases. Thank you both for joining me. How are you doing? Great. Hey, How are you? Great. So um, when we first proposed this as a, a kind of topic for discussion, um, I remember that uh, I think, Rob, you linked me uh, a recent documentary called My Octopus Teacher on Netflix. Now, Netflix aren't um, advertising this podcast, but uh, if they want to, then I'd be very happy to have a free subscription for a year. But nonetheless, it, it does provide us a backdrop for what we want to talk about today. So, Rob, do you mind just, just telling us a little bit about what this documentary is about? Yeah. So the um, the the story was that a, um, a South African cameraman got burned out from his career, sort of retreated to his his childhood home and started sort of swimming every day and um, diving and came across this octopus, the young octopus, and then sort of came up with this sort of crazy idea of going back every day and interacting with the same octopus. Um, so not just treating this as sort of the sort of pretty fish or the things that you see when you dive, but actually mm -hmm. interacting with this octopus as an individual and built up this relationship over, I think it was a, about a year or so, um, which for an octopus is most of its life. Mm. So um, the typical octopus sort of, um, I think the, the longest live octopus only lives for a handful of years handful of years so very different from us oh. and um in during this sort of year he would dive every day to go and see this octopus and they gradually sort of um from his perspective developed a relationship with this octopus and and saw what it would do to interact with him the way that it explored his body sort of with his tentacles tasting him with his suckers and um the 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 sort of challenges it faced the way it hid itself um, the first time it, he saw it, it was covered in shells mm. and it had, it had very quickly grabbed all these shells with his suckers and gone to this ball. So it just looked like this sort of mound of shells. And um, that's what grabbed his attention. What's what's going on? And then six months later, the same thing happened again when it was being chased by sharks. And it was it's sort of uh, it's basically hiding. And all you could see was his eyes peeping out between these between these shells. The, the sort of themes of the, 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 the film were, apart from his relationship with the, the octopus, was how at the same time that there was, there seemed to be this process of mutual sort of investigation of each other, that it wasn't sort of just a human sort of observing something in the natural world, that the octopus was spending time sort of exploring him and finding out about him. And the sense of there being this very alien um, cognition um, a, a different way of, 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 of being intelligent and, and solving problems. So octopuses are, um, on the one hand, they're just incredibly smart animals, but on the other hand, they're just so different from us. I already said they only live for a few years. On top of that, these are animals that, um, that they're very solitary. So we, we think of our, our intelligence and our cognition, so much of it is in a social communicative domain. That's just not the way an octopus is. So it, it's both something where we see a, a huge amount of intelligence in, a, in another species. Hey, I'm getting the sense here that essentially what you're sort of saying to me is that often we think that humans are, are quite different from animals. And maybe in some respects we are, but actually in many respects, animals can display very, very intelligent abilities um, that, that we can't or equally the perhaps in many respects sometimes the things that we think are uniquely human perhaps aren't that uniquely human so i guess perhaps maybe you can give some examples based on research that you know uh, of examples of where maybe the differences between humans and animals isn't really as apparent as we often think it is um 
for example, a lot of the examples of a lot of the effort of research that's gone into this has been in our, our nearest neighbours into um, uh, into into chimpanzees. So, um, for example, theory of mind is something that we would think of as a as a, a very human ability. The the fact that I'm as, as we're, we're chatting now, I'm sort of trying to put myself in in your mind and sort of thinking, am I making sense to you? Am, am I sort of like changing the way that I'm presenting myself the things that I'm saying to the audience that I'm meant to be speaking to. I've got my, my mind partly on the, the huge YouTube audience that's going to be listening to this later as well. All the rest of all of that nonsense that, 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 we're, that, that we do just as part of being human. Um, but is it the case that, that any other animals do that? They, they, they can put themselves into um, a, another animal's shoes. And um, so there's been a a huge sort of tradition of um, experiments in mm. primatology trying to sort of figure out whether whether chimpanzees, to what degree, for example, can chimpanzees do that sort of thing mm. and in what sort of context. And it, it turns out that for chimpanzees, you kind of have to make it a competitive thing. So if you if it's if it's about um, trying to trying to steal some food food from somebody else, if if you hide the food, if you hide the food so that the chimpanzee realizes that another chimpanzee won't be able to, wouldn't know where that food is, the chimp, the focal chimpanzee will make decisions based on what it could reasonably assume the other chimpanzee to know and what it wouldn't know. So it could withhold reaching for the 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 the, the, the banana until the other chimpanzee has gone away, and things like that. So that would be one example of a very social example of cognition and intelligent behavior that we wouldn't necessarily think I, I i wouldn't necessarily have thought would be something that that, that other animals would be able to do i was just gonna like i guess jump in there and just sort of say that what's really cool about that example as well rob um there are almost like two sides of empathy isn't there there's you know this nice kind of oh we can make friends you know we can bond with others side then i suppose there's almost that darker side of like to lie to someone it actually requires a lot of empathy because you have to understand exactly how much the other person is willing to believe. And it's almost like, you know, that negative empathy is very intelligent. It's almost like that chimp, not so much a lie, I guess that's a bit far stretched, but you know, he was doing that, he was concealing that information. So, very so, yeah, I think that two of the, um, the leads of that field sort of coined the phrase Machiavellian intelligence to describe this, this sort of, this, this, this ability. Um, yeah, it's a sort of manipulative sort of um, the, the idea to, to treat others as social as, as social tools. It's not something that, 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 yeah, highly regarded often in human society, but it's still pretty impressive if another animal could do it. Definitely. And also, um, it's not just chimps, like you said, like, obviously, that's the main one, because they're so close to us in terms of our evolutionary past, like, but I think there's also a study that does something similar with ravens. If I'm right, so ravens um, cache food, which means they kind of, you know, hide their food for later, especially over the winter months. And what's really interesting is that if you put a raven, you know, in a cage with another raven, they'll sort of um, stop themselves from going to go find their food again because they know, you know, if I go over here and eat this food in front of this other raven, he then knows my hiding place. And so it's something that maybe even ravens can do, which is really cool because you know, corvid birds like ravens, crows, magpies. And those kind of birds, they also seem to be quite intelligent. And that's right. definitely a, a human quality, right? Because I do that at home. I have my own secret stash that I do not tell <laughs> my partner where it is. And, you know, because you know that's mine for whenever I want it. So that's certainly a, a very human-like quality. So it's amazing to see that they're also present in animals that we are very, very different from. I, I don't know if there are any other examples that we can we can give. Um, well, I just wanted to come back to that. The, the, the food caching ones is kind of, it, it also is a good one because it gets to something that, um, that, that is, it, it's often a feature when we try to do these comparisons between species because there are also species that specialize in, in, in caching food. So, I mean, uh, squirrels, for example, everyone knows squirrels hide nuts and et cetera, and they have their own cognitive strategies for making sure they can find nuts. They don't necessarily remember e each one is buried. But then you can take another corvid, like a, a blue uh, blue jay, um, and um, they are sort of like champion caches. And I think they can remember something like where they've hidden two thousand or so different sort of um, food caches, oh, wow. which, which I, I don't know how your you, how your food hiding 
um, that is here. One, one, what you got one, 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 one well plate guarded plate. secret, <laughs> yeah. So, when, well, you know, once you get to 2000, what well, so it's, it's a bit different, and, and that's often what happens with animals is that other species of animals is that there'll be a particular cognitive domain where they'll, they'll really sort of specialize right. in um, being amazing at that one thing. So the, the type of animal behavior that I, I spend a lot of my time researching is birdsong. Um, and these are sort of not, not, not just corvids or parrots, you know, the super brainy birds, but the sort of, you know, the typical boring birds you get in your garden with, with brains the size of, a, of, of my thumbnail. And yet they, when, when they're learning their songs, they're, that they, they learn them by copying other individuals very precisely. They have traditions that last for thousands of years of passing on songs from generation to, 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 to generation. Um, they can have equivalents to phonemes and all sorts of other sort of aspects of, which was, you know, which are, which are familiar from, from, from our own communication systems. Um, they're not particularly cognitively uh, amazingly flexible with other things. They don't, you know, I don't think anyone's ever thought of looking at theory of mind in, in, in the sort of you know, garden birds that I, I work on. But for that one particular specialization of, of, of learning vocalizations, that they can, they can be incredibly sophisticated. So in a way, I guess a part of the problem is we often assume intelligence to be this monolithic, it's the way that we think about it in humans. But then also B, I, I get the impression then what you're sort of telling me is, is there really much use to really trying to compare intelligence across species when the intelligence is gonna dramatically differ across different domains, if that makes sense? I guess like, yeah, no, that's brilliant. My first sort of two thoughts, A, you know, going back to the octopus, um, the, the many octopi that live in the ocean, the reason why they're so intelligent is because, you know, part of it is they have to avoid predators. So like we said earlier, an octopus teacher having to like hide under the shells from that shark. And also they have to look for food, you know, their food could be anywhere, it could be down those tiny little crevices. And, you know, that's kind of slightly different then for why an ape needs intelligence, because obviously apes, including us, I guess, we're very social and we need that intelligence socially. Like you said, it's comparing then two very different domains and two very different reasons why they might have evolved. And I guess going back to your second question, it's very difficult to assess intelligence in these different animals, but it's still a necessary task, I think. I don't know if Rob agrees there, but... Um, you know, basically one of the reasons why we do so much comparative work in evolution is because we want to understand exactly where does it come from? You know, where does our intelligence come from? Okay, you know, you might argue we're special, we are the most most intelligent animals, but still leaves open the question, you know, where did the precursor to intelligence come from? Where did the precursor to consciousness come from? So it's by testing all these different species and being able to pinpoint, you know, oh, that's where the precursor of intelligence, you know, social intelligence or um, theory of mind or maybe some other kind of intelligence. We like to know those precursors come from it's precisely so we can say, oh, you know, it must have come from a common ancestor, I don't know, 8 million years back with chimps, 14 million years back for another species. You know, we like to sort of pinpoint that time frame. So I guess that's why we still try to test it. Yeah, and I think... Um, I, I think the, the other thing is that sometimes when, when you get these different windows onto different intelligences, it, it tells, it, it, it sort of highlights in a way different aspects of, of our own intelligence. The fact that you can see these different ways to, to, to be intelligent is that are so dramatically different from, from ours or, or so restricted to a particular domain of our own intelligence is, is something that sort of helps, I, I think, is, can provide help to sort of dissecting out our, our own in, intelligence into, into, into different dimensions. Yeah, and I guess the kind of thing that then comes to my mind is we've talked a lot about how obviously animals can display very, very highly intelligent or even human-like abilities in certain regards. But I suppose obviously we shouldn't ignore the elephant in the room, so to speak, that we are clearly at the same time fundamentally different from them you know our ability or well i mean the fact that we are the most prolific species on the planet is not a testament to in some respects probably how different we are and i think human consciousness mm -hmm. has gone some way to to that so i guess at the same time can we also speak to maybe some differences is mm -hmm. consciousness a fundamental difference between humans and animals and I guess you also mentioned theory of mind earlier. So chimps do have a level of theory of mind. 
is it to the same extent as humans or <laughs> the, so I think these these are the things where it gets really really hard to, to answer I think that we have some ideas in in some domains about things which are, are unique to us the things which are easier to spot and then other things the the, the, the things which are harder as a psychologist to investigate in humans they just become exponentially harder to study in, in, in other species. And the more the more it relies on flexibility of behavior, the harder it is as well. So the example that, you know, the, the sort of textbook example is, is, is clever hands of people misattributing intelligence to an animal because they, just because they, that was the most natural human like solution to them. But it, so the story of clever hands was a, a horse that was taken around showgrounds in in europe and it could supposedly do sums it could do math so the it's um its owner would say what's eight plus four and clever hands would sort of clop its um, hoof 12 times and everyone would gasp and it turned out that that hans was solving this problem in a, an intelligent way but what it was doing was reacting to the body language of the people around it so this was sort of like sort of question for comparative psychology like how could how can, an, how can a horse do maths? Mm. And it turns out you have to think more like uh, what, what a horse actually sees so that it can respond to the stimuli around it. It can respond to people sort of standing back or gasping or holding their breaths when it gets to the right number. And it was using that as a way to actually, to, to actually answer the right question. And, and that sort of still raises it heads, its head today. You know, whenever we see an animal doing something that to us looks really intelligent, to what extent is this um, a, a behavior that's reached by some simpler simpler route? Is there is there some sort of um, um, inbuilt genetic sort of aspect to it? Or um, is it simply sort of relying on the difference of stimuli from its environment that we're not even aware of or, 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 or that we overlooked? So it's, mm. it's, it's a very difficult problem to, to, to actually sort of, to, to actually solve. So, I think so. So consciousness is a really difficult one. I think now, now the the, the, the new legislation that's sort of come in is trying to is, is recognise the fact that the, the, there's a general agreement of that, that that there's many other animals that are sentient, but what it is to be them, what it is mm -hmm. to actually have their level of consciousness, even even if level level of consciousness is even the right way to say it, is is impossible to say. Um, we're the only species with anything like symbolic language, and it's very hard to divorce our mm. consciousness from symbolic language so definitely yeah i mean certainly the the symbolic nature to humans is something that sticks out as being well on face value at least from my, where i sit something that distinguishes us and i i guess what i'm hearing from sort of an evolutionary point of view and, and some of the evidence is that we're not really as different from animals than we really think um, in some ways, the differences are just because of the evolutionary uh, environments that we've, we've had to overcome. That you know they've got different challenges to humans, and therefore have evolved in different ways to be intelligent in different ways. If if, that, uh, if I'm following you correctly, but I guess the question is then, if we aren't really that different, then why do we often spend our um, lives often trying to emphasise that human animals are very very different from each other? I suppose, I don't know whether you have any particular explanations on this, but I guess from the background I'm in a, a, as an existential psychologist, I've actually got just a, kind of one or two quotes that I really, I really love teaching these quotes to, to students because I think it really illuminates some of the issues about human beings. But Eric Fromm, for example, he noted that, um, or queried why humans don't necessarily go insane from the existential contradiction of being um, you know, essentially a symbolic being encased in a symbolic self that seems to give us infinite worth, yet we are stuck in a body that's worth about 98 cents. And I think the point that, you know, Eric Fromm and other people like Ernest Becker make is, um, you know, existence for humans is to be aware um, that it's fairly meaningless in some respects if we are just to accept we are here just to breathe and live and then die and decay like every other species and living thing on the planet. And so existentialists sort of say that this is fundamentally problematic. And so one, one way that humans have tried to overcome this problem is to divorce ourselves from nature. We, we elevate ourselves 
above nature. We often, for example, believe in the supernatural um, to, to push us away from the, the basic laws of uh, science about how we decay and die, as an example. And we've often spent a lot of time as well um, distancing ourselves from nature. We've cultivated landscapes and so forth. So that's like an existential perspective is that we fundamentally struggle to accept the realities of what it is to be human, which is just to be another animal. Um, I don't know whether there are, are potentially other explanations you might put forward as to why maybe we've often said we're, we're quite unique when perhaps we're not so unique. I mean, I think that anybody who spends a lot of time with animals is confronted with a lot of death and and, and suffering. I mean, and you, you mentioned, um, you, 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 I mean, I think when your focus is like the natural world and you, you go out and you see, um, um, if you if you spend any any time in nature, you see you see you come across dead animals. You come across animals killing each other, and and animal lives somehow. If you're just walking through their environment, they don't they seem to be cheap in the sense that that there's so much death around. It's, it also applies to the way that we treat um, farm animals. So um, I, I think something that makes a lot of people very uncomfortable, in particular, is if 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 you you know, if you start discussing sort of how cognitively sophisticated pigs are, um, mm -hmm. out of all the farm animals, I think they're they're far and away the, the most sophisticated cognitively in, in the sorts of tests that people do do for these things. But it's it's an uncomfortable it's an uncomfortable fact because of the way that we treat pigs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that, that I think that that must that must add to add to the add to the way that we the way that we look at this. I don't know how important it is to our current culture, but the the, the religious hangover of the of the way that um, people are still uncomfortable about the theory of evolution in general, just the fact that, that we are on the same the, the, in in, in, mm -hmm. in the same kingdom as as all these other creatures. So that those would be things oh. I would mention. I don't know, Aisha, what you would. Yeah. Oh no, brilliant. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I just want to jump on what you said at the end there because it really struck a chord with me. But another thing to be aware of evolution is that because nothing is kind of divorced from politics as much as you wish it would be, but you're talking about something that at the end of the day did start kind of in that Victorian era, you know, so yes, there is to some extent going to be, you know, humans are better than animals interwoven into that theory because it was just such a religious time. And also just, you know, like as, as awful as it is, you know, that was sort of the height of the British empire. So there's also a lot of, you know, white centered european centered you know kind of perspective written into it as well so there's definitely this idea that particular cultures um in general are the best kind of from that time point and that's obviously something we we're moving away from as a science and we're definitely trying to divorce ourselves from but of course there was that kind of um i guess the, that negative underpinning from the past and i do think that still drives us today somewhat when we're talking about the fact that humans you know, are better than animals. And I think as well, um, some of it definitely comes from the language that we use, like something Rob mentioned about animals killing other animals. We love to watch that as documentaries, don't we? And how many times you watch a documentary about a great white shark and you'll hear the narrator say something like, he's at the top of the chain. Like, and he'll say it in that dramatic voice, he'll be like, he is the king of evolution. And it's like, you know, obviously the whole point of evolution is that we are all as evolved as each other because we've all, in theory, gone back to some sort of common ancestor. Mm. I found out the other day, common ancestor called Luca, Disney reference. Um, you know, so this this fit, um, Luca, in theory, that we're all kind of going back to, you know, we've all been on the planet sort of the same amount of time as each other. So, you know, you can't say the shark is more evolved than the other fish. They've just evolved to do different things. We can't even say that the human is more evolved than the shark. You know, are we? We've, we've evolved to do different things. We're all, we're all tips on a tree. Yeah, we're all tips on a tree, exactly. So it just always makes me laugh when there's this conception that evolution is a ladder mm. that we all have to climb. And some people are like climbing to the top faster. And I guess it's that survival of the fittest thing you know, which was like a real kind of a very much an oversimplification, I guess. And it's really been stretched beyond what it was originally intended for. But I think people really use this concept now, the survival of the fittest to justify this kind of worldview of like a rat race 
where you know certain social groups got to climb that ladder or even just you know more broadly like we were saying humans versus animals you know we've got to put humans at the top of that ladder and other animals below but in reality it's more of a tree and you know less of a ladder so I do think it's very interesting the way that we that we talk about this um, outside of academia and the way that this has been presented in documentaries and in media in general that's definitely really affected I think how humans see themselves in light of evolution. I mean and I would I, I would say though that with, with all of this emphasis on commonalities I mean there, there are ways in which we're a unique species and that, that mm -hmm. our and, and if, if, if we're a unique species, the way that we're unique, this, the interesting way we're unique is in our psychology and, um, and, and the things that that, that, that that gives us. So although we, we can talk about all these similarities between us and other species, that there, it, it is also the case that there is no other species that, that appears to have anything like a, the sort of symbolic culture that mm. we have. And that's... Yeah. Uh, that's what's enabled us to transform the world more than yeah. any other single species. So, yeah, and I think yeah. that's a, a good point, you know, about how certainly the symbolic culture seems fairly unique to us. But of course, uh, I'm aware that, um, as far as I understand, some other animals do display certain signs of culture, maybe not in the exact same way that we do, but I think that other animals do have some, some culture. So Rob, I believe that you, you're familiar with some work displaying sort of whale culture is that correct yeah so what was one of the one of the sort of the the, the classic examples of that is is humpback whale song for example so it's, song isn't the only thing that's that's transmitted socially in the forms cultures in 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 in, in, way, in humpback whales but it's the one that's most famous so the um this is this has been studied for quite a long time now but the, the the full sophistication of it still being unraveled and the the, the sort of general idea is that in the the whales humpback whales the males sing these courtship songs to females they go on for sort of 10 minutes each and if you go to any one population so for example the population in western australia there's a i think five to ten thousand um whales in that population and all the males will sing the same song in any one year um, but they'll switch to a new song within a in a period of uh, a few weeks. Every every year or so, they'll switch to a new song, um, and all of the males will switch to the same new song at, at once. And as what seems to be happening is actually that what they're what they're learning is the song from the next population over. So the song that's the current hit in Perth one year will be fashionable in Sydney a couple of years later. And it will gradually work its way across the Pacific. So you can find sort of more or less the same song um, in South America, sort of seven or eight years later. So, so hopping from population to population and traveling thousands of miles by the whales learning this, the song from each other. So that's, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty sort of astonishing feat of, of learning that, that it's got a lot of aspects that sort of seem a bit familiar to the way that we might sort of mm gradually sort of pull in sort of innovations from from other 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 social groups and things that, that new ideas gradually spread through through populations are they more spice girl fans or metallica fans i don't know what, what kind of <laughs> well, maybe it maybe it depends on which year you're asking ah, I see. <laughs> well, maybe a fusion between the two um so very finally i just also wanted to ask so it seems to be the, that certain animals do display kind of some level of culture, although it is to some degree different from our own as well. So what are the kind of limits of non-human culture or animal culture? What, what necessarily might delineate the kind of culture that we talk about with humans versus, versus animals? So with animals and just any culture in general, broadly speaking, culture is just sharing social information, right? And we know that pretty much most animals are actually capable of that. Even animals, like we said, going back to octopus teacher that live alone, they are still capable of that social interaction and you know sharing that social information. Um, and you know what you find a lot of the times is that these are behaviours that maybe could be learned individually. So maybe, for example, you know a common example is termite fishing with chimpanzees. You know maybe one chimpanzee discovers the stick that they can you know poke through to get their termites out, and then you know it's just a very quick case of them. Um, 
after one discovers it, because they are all observing, they're all learning from this one person, it does spread very quickly socially. And I think a lot of animals have that ability. But I suppose the difference, I suppose, of where humans kind of become a bit more special and a bit different is that we might be the only species to have cumulative culture. So cumulative culture is something a bit further than just sharing social information. Uh, Rob said earlier, standing on the shoulders of giants, and that's a brilliant um, terminology for cumulative culture. It really is. So what do we mean by cumulative culture? Well, it's things like we can recombine. So for example, the Swiss army knife, that's just a bit of everything, isn't it, in one tool. Someone had to, you know, take all these tools that already existed and put it in this tool. And to make that, you know, there had to be all these different innovations from different people at different times. And we just built upon that um, over time. And I suppose it's this idea, and we also can use things for like new purposes. So for example, we have axes, like a lot of different cultures have axes and they've kind of like, you can see that they've emerged at different points because, you know, the style of weapons in say early Europe is different to the style of weapons in like the early Middle East. But they had multiple purposes, obviously. It wasn't just for attacking people. Like for example, you can use an ax to crush grapes to make juice. So people have this like really inventive way of like, using a tool for something it was never um, meant to be used for originally. And all of this stuff is kind of the hallmarks of cumulative culture. It's about the fact that we are just all, you know, involved and we are all a group in this together. And it really is about sort of building upon like what one person's done before. And I've done these really cute studies with children actually, where, um, you know, there's this really complicated little puzzle for them to solve. And they test like groups of small children and groups of chimps on these sort of puzzle boxes. And children can solve them and the chimps can't. And it's not because the children are actually being smarter, it's because the children will, not even so much that they will work together, but they can, you know, accumulate their ideas together. So one child will solve sort of step one, mm -hmm. and then that prompts the second child to solve step two. And it kind of just, you know, snowballs and children can't do it alone. You know, even the smartest child in that sample couldn't have done the whole puzzle on their own without help from the other children. So it's about like, you know, really kicking off each other's ideas and using it as a springboard. And I suppose it's that cumulative culture, which, you know, might be um, considered uniquely human. But having said that, there's this really cute um, research I found the other day that I just wanted to throw out to see what you and Rob thought. But, um, you know, there's this really um, important guy in the field called Andrew Whiten, who's studied a lot of um, cumulative culture and social learning, and he's been studying chimpanzees. And he had this really cute example of actually what might be cumulative culture or the beginnings of it in a chimp troop. Um, obviously, this is very early days observation, so I don't know um, the full ins and outs. But basically, what he observed these chimps do, it went beyond just, you know, using the stick to poke the termites. It was quite complex. So he actually observed this group of chimps um, walk up to a termite site and they'd have a big stick with them and also a little stick. So they had two tools you know, tools. <laughs> and you know, what they'd actually do when they got to the termite site, they wouldn't actually go to the hill, but they'd stand a little bit back from it. And they'd get their big stick and they'd sort of push it into the ground. And he said it was almost like watching a human use a spade, like they would sort of dig with their little, their big stick. And once they sort of dug, you know, um, down a bit, they then take their little stick, sort of bite into it, make it into a little brush. And then they use the brush to sort of pick up the termites. And what's really cool about that is that you know, it's a two-step process with two tools, which the chimp had to bring with it to the termite hill. So it's kind of, there's a lot of planning there. And, you know, it, it could still have been one really smart chimp that discovered it, I suppose. But it's quite interesting. It does suggest this multi-stepped process. And perhaps, you know, maybe with our closest cousins, we're starting to see a bit of cumulative culture there. But as far as I know, besides that one little example, um, as far as I know, it's just humans that have cumulative culture. So, so there's, yeah, mm. I mean, that that's 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 more or less right. I think that there's um there's a few other sort of like examples around the that sort of begin to hint at sort of this um this ability to to, to build on others others' knowledge. So sometimes, for example, I think the the routes which pigeons take can gradually become more efficient over time. Um, cool. that that it that re requires sort of multiple sort of improvements to the route that they're taking from to get from a to b there are lots of examples like this but like the, the, for mm -hmm. example with the the, the the chimpanzee thing with the termites there's always a sense that there's a there's a quite a 
sharp limit about where where that will stop and, it, and it's not the sort of level of, of where humans who would might start sort of figuring out ways to industrially produce termites or to um to get them at ever ever sort of increasing sort of quantities the, the chimpanzee cultures with termites are probably always going to stop with sort of sticking a, a stick into the termite nest and and getting the getting the termites out, termites out that way so that it, to the extent that there is community of culture in animals, it, it, it is a much sort of like simpler um, level than what what we what you would see in in any human um, society. I mean, I think this has all been really, really fascinating. It's always interesting to get insights into areas of psychology that that are not my own. Uh, so I'd like to thank both of you for um, joining today and, and providing some some insights into humans and animals. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you. Before Thanks you go. I thought it would be good to finish with a, a bit of a quiz, if you don't mind. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> um, that quiz, again, put together by uh, myself, so that evinces clearly the high quality nature of this quiz that it's going to be, um, <clears throat> is on common phobias. So I am going to name out some uh, technical terms for phobias, and I just want you to guess what phobia you think that is and then i will tell you how many people this is based on a yougov poll of uk no. citizens how many uk citizens have this phobia so they're fairly common so hopefully it won't be too exotic um so let's start with the first one uh, i hope i'm going to pronounce these all correct uh but the first one is acrophobia Acro. acrophobia so i don't know if you're good with latin that might give you a clue otherwise just mm -hmm. go into the kind of common nature that most people, well not most people, but a significant minority of people will report these kind of phobias. Um, <laughs> spiders or mites? They... <laughs> spiders you're saying, Rob? What about Aisha? I know acro is a bit different. I was thinking like arachnophobia for That's spiders. Yeah, right. acro. Acro does sound bug-like though, doesn't it? Mm. I'm just trying to think of like things that people are commonly afraid of because I was thinking that um heights and like confined spaces would be at the top but I'm pretty sure the word I don't know I can't remember it ever sounding like acro the word for heights or, or small spaces I know I think acro does sound a bit buggish doesn't it so we're going fear of bugs is that is that what we're going for I'm it's actually pretty, pretty sure it's wrong but I haven't got anything better so Aisha, you uh, did actually say the correct answer, but didn't go with it. It is actually fear of heights. I'm assuming acro, because acrobat, maybe there is some sort of, I mean, I've got yeah, shared route there. Latin. Uh, you know what I was thinking? I was just thinking in fear of heights is vertigo, but that's something different, isn't it? Vertigo yeah. is just being sick. Oh, yeah. oops, my bad. So apparently 35% of the UK population have fear of heights. Now, I'm at least one of those individuals. I don't know if either of you have a fear of heights or are you okay with heights? Uh, it depends on the height. <laughs> how, how high <laughs> up, Rob, do we have to get until you start saying that's enough for me? Well, I had to collect nests from the top of trees, sort of like hanging over cliffs, and I didn't like that very much. Oh. <laughs> about 10 feet off the floor, and I start going, this is too rich for my blood pressure. <laughs> Okay, let's move to the next one. Uh, the next one is glossophobia. Glossophobia. You know what I'm thinking is going to be, I don't think it's this, but it just sort of hit me. I think clown phobia is going to be really high, but I don't think clown would be called glosso. I'm just moving away from it. I think it would be just called clownophobia. That, I'm not sure it's a Latin. That you're <laughs> fearing clowns, is that, is that what you're predicating this on? <laughs> glossophobia, it's got to be something to do with words, hasn't it? Oh yeah, of course. I can't have you afraid of words. What about fear of the dark? That's got to be near the top. I don't think, yeah, glosso does sound like words though, not like darkness. You're on the right lines with words. I think if you keep thinking on these lines, but I won't give you forever because- Oh no. Uh, what well, is it the fear of like being tongue tied in public uh, and forgetting the, your words? Or the, or the fear of talking in public. Yes, yes. So fear of public speaking is glossophobia. And one in five uh, British people have a fear of public speaking. And the other four are lying. Yeah, and the other four are lying, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next one, this is our most prevalent fear of the five that I selected, is called aphidiophobia. 
um, I don't know if I've pronounced it correctly, but ophidiophobia. Ophidio. O P H I D I O Ophidio. I presume that's how you pronounce it. Ophidio. Sounds Greek, doesn't it? Maybe that's the clowns. <laughs> And you know what it reminded me of? It kind of, I don't know why, it reminded me of Oedipus complex a bit. I think Ophidio just sounded a bit similar. I don't know how to make Oedipus complex into anything more weird than it already is, but <laughs> a fear of discovering that you have the Oedipus complex. <laughs> um, just, the, go on. What are the most common ones you thought of again, Aisha? Most common, I think fear of the dark would be up there. Oh, a feeder po. No, no, it's birds, right? I haven't tricked you, and it's not a bird thing. I know Rob loves birds. <laughs> I honestly thought you just got on Rob then. I was like, it's birds, it's birds. <laughs> I mean, this is, I did say it's probably the most prevalent fear, at least with this one. Fear of the dark, sorry? Uh, so if I give you a clue, 52% of people in the UK reported having this fear. Now, I certainly have it. It's literally the no thank you. I absolutely despise. I won't say any further, but this uh, is a very common fear. Shark? Shark. Sharks, that's a good one. We're not getting on the right lines. Animals is correct. If we, go, if we go down the route of animals, we will get there eventually. Oh, and it's not birds, though. It's not, it's, not, it's not birds. It's not sharks. And it's not spiders. I'm assuming you, you guys aren't scared of these then. No, um, terrified of sharks. A feed of, is it like wriggly things like snakes and eels and stuff? Yeah, so, so it is, it's the fear of snakes. Um, my, uh, and, yeah. my mum is afraid of snakes. And uh, so is um, Indiana Jones. There you go. Famous reference for you. Yeah, I just couldn't. No, no, just I'm just going to move on because it just is already kind of freaking me out just talking about he it. He doesn't say that, does he, Harrison Ford? He's an academic that's down with the kids. He says, why did it have to be snakes? He doesn't sit there and say, why did it have to be ornithophysicist? Whatever that word was. <laughs> the unnecessary Latin of snakes. <laughs> okay, so the next one, uh, we've got two more. This two one more. is called coolrophobia. Coolrophobia. Again, I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing these correct. Is that clowns? Clowns has to be up there. I mean, if you keep saying clowns, he's going to correct me at some point. It is clowns. Um, <laughs> fear of clowns is the correct answer. That 12% of individuals, um, and those 12%, I assume, were like me, got exposed to watching it at a very young age, and subsequently then was put off clowns. Uh, Tim Curry's it was better it's than the I'm afraid of everything. So uh, <laughs> the next one, uh, I can say I don't have the fear of, but it is... Not that uncommon, 5% have the fear of, well, it's called nyctophobia. What do you reckon nyctophobia is? The fear of smoking? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not the fear of smoking. Is it something to do with eyes or darkness or something? Like nycto, nycto is something to do with eyelids, isn't it? Sometimes it's normal. Yeah, you're on the right. Ooh, the fear of being stabbed in the eye. That's a big one in horror films. No one likes eye stuff. <laughs> It is a song by Iron Maiden as well, I believe. Fear of the... And you you did say it, Rob, as well, just a second ago, so... Oh, that's not helping. <laughs> Fear of Night? Night? Sorry? Fear of Night Time? Uh, yeah, so I think it's Fear of the Night slash Fear of the Dark. The Dark. And obviously Fear of the Dark is, I believe, an Iron Maiden song, which was my clue. So 5% oh. of people report being afraid of the dark and therefore sleep with nightlights and, and various things. Uh, so those are my top five common common phobias. I have three of the five, I believe. Yeah, about three. I mean, I could be here all day listing my phobias, to be honest. Probably, <laughs> as I was saying to Aisha before we go on, it's probably quicker for me to tell you what I'm not afraid of. What is your most fearful things before we before we leave it? Rob, what, what do you fear most? Sharks. It was Sharks. Jaw, uh, same story with you and clowns, seeing Jaws. Seeing jaw, actually, I think worse than Jaws were those like those um james bond movies where they would have shark tanks they they that mm -hmm. was that put me off swimming pools for a long time i guess you're not a fan of the sharknado series then i haven't gone near it no <laughs> no I, I mean even watching this like octopus um documentary i was like there's no way i could uh no way i could do that and i sure i i'm assuming it's clowns but maybe i'm wrong no, actually, I don't mind clowns. I just like horror films, and I've just seen many clowns over the years. And I was like, 
You know what, actually, it's quite a funny story. Um, the reason why I knew it was such a common phobia was because I knew someone who was terrified. Like, it was actually, like, such a phobia for him that he couldn't, like, watch certain movies or TV shows in case a clown popped up. So that's how I knew it was such a big thing, because just seeing his reaction to it was um, unprecedented. <laughs> but no, um, I can't joke, because I have a pretty bad phobia of spiders. Oh, okay. I also have a phobia of spiders. Spiders, snakes, I'd probably add sharks to that list. I mean, it's not as high up on my list, but I probably wouldn't want to be in a shark tank. Um, yeah, I, I think I could be here all day, probably. Lots of <laughs> I think it's probably best that we, we draw a line under this. Um, thank you both very much for uh, taking part, and I hope to have you on the show again soon. Definitely. Oh, lovely to be back, but hopefully not talking about spiders. Yeah, we could talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Sure. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you for watching the Psychology Debrief. If you have any suggestions for new topics, quizzes, or any other content psychology related, feel free to get in touch via email or Twitter. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Bye.